Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 10 of the Long Haul Podcast. First milestone of the podcast, and uh, it's Easter as well. So, so to celebrate that, we, uh, we've got a special cast for, for you this week. Um, as always, my name's Nine. I'm joined by my co-host, um, Kerry. Hey, man. Hey, what's up, man? There's multiple reasons why today's episode is special to me. You know, throughout my life, I've played tons of games and a lot of the friends and social circles I'm, uh, I, I have uh, now that I'm an adult uh, have been shaped by, by games. And uh, the, the most important of those games is Magic the Gathering. And uh, today it is an honor to be able to interview our two guests, Scaff Elias and Richard Garfield. Welcome to the cast, guys. Hello. Hi. So I think, uh, you know, there's no need for introductions. Everyone knows who you guys are. But uh, just to, uh, to kickstart the conversation, I, 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 I did wonder while I was researching why you call yourselves the three donkeys. Oh, so you found the uh, answer? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I didn't search it. I wanted to hear it from you. <laughs> well, uh, we used to name uh, prototypes randomly. Uh, and, and so we would roll uh, the names for prototypes from... Uh, from dictionaries or thesauruses, so I ended up with prototypes that were named Unabated and uh, Ghost Noodle. And when we uh, started our company, we decided to name it randomly, and we rolled uh, a, a random name from the dictionary, and it was Triassic. And uh, I usually allow myself some latitude for uh, interpreting the random result, and so Triassic became three donkeys. <laughs> nice. So th that was very uh, ghost noodle would be an interesting one too yeah ghost noodle came from uh i, I think uh in it in the thesaurus it was uh intelligence or something and in under intelligence there was ghost and noodle uh or maybe it was head or something i don't know uh soul or but anyway that's the the way in which uh, i was generating these names at the time okay cool that explains it uh, so, you're obviously uh, professional game designers, uh, and I kind of wanted to, to ask how your relationship with games has changed over the years. You know, not just your own games, but uh, in general, how do you interact with games nowadays? Uh, when, when, when you have free time, do you still play games, and what kind of games do you play? Uh, I, I play games as much as I can, uh, and uh, the biggest change for me uh, has been the fact that uh, when I was growing up in the uh, 70s and 80s, uh, finding games was tough. You had to get every piece of value out of them uh, because, the, because it was going to be a long time before you found a new one. And now it's like trying to take a sip of water from a fire hose. It's ridiculous <laughs> how many games there are. Uh, you've, uh, you've obviously recently published Keyforge and other things, but uh, do you play other games that are not uh, of your own creation? Uh, I, I play almost exclusively other games that are of, not of my creation, uh, and that's because when I play my own games, uh, except for prototypes, I play a lot of prototypes, so when I play my own games, all, all I can do is uh, redesign them while I'm playing them, and, uh, and so I find it uh, uh, more work uh, and less learning. Uh, so, so yeah, I play a lot of, uh, uh, a lot, a lot of uh, games from other designers. And the games I play have changed just because now I have to play with my children. So I just play games with my kids. Uh, it does not matter whether uh, I help design them or not. Um, it's just whatever they want, except for, again, as Richard said, for prototypes. Yeah, makes sense. So, so uh, some specific names, though. I've been playing uh, recently uh, uh, Auto Chess uh, on Dota. I think that's uh, uh, really got some interesting stuff going on. Um, and then for... Uh, uh, board games recently. Well, recently I've been playing Spite and Malice, which is just a traditional card game, but uh, but also uh, uh, Paper Tales is an excellent uh, drafting game, and uh, and War Chest is is a, a really interesting uh, uh, sort of tactical token building game. Yeah, really nice. That's cool. I, I got the same situation as uh, as Scaff now. Uh, the part of playing <laughs> games with my kids is just starting. <laughs> Yeah. So guys, uh, from all these years that you guys worked together and created games, 
are there like a time when you look at the game that you you're, you're creating and you you look at it and see this is going to be a total success or when you publish a game is there is there something that after it's published and you see something that happened with it that you say this is this is a total success even if it's not like one of those games that sells insanely you just feel that the community that embraced it just feels that the game is just like perfect how do you define success basically yeah 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 uh, uh... I, I mean, usually I define success as finding a, 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 a it's got to be more than just a dedicated audience because you can get, uh, because the, the reach of games these days is such that, that there's a dedicated audience for almost everything. Uh, so there has to be some breadth. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, uh, if it finds a, a, a reasonable, a reasonably large community of people who like it, then, then, uh, then, then I would consider it a success, which, uh, is, Probably, you know, uh, I, I would imagine if my publishers are disappointed, I'm probably disappointed as well. Right. Um, also, there's success for the game design, and then there's success for the game, which are I think are two different things. Mm -hmm. And you know, what we're after obviously is success for the game, not success for the game design. But it is possible to really like one aspect of the product and not the others. So um, I thought it was super, super interesting that you mentioned uh, Dora Auto Chess. Obviously, it's a really um, successful mod or game. I think soon it will be standalone if it isn't already. Um, I don't play it myself. But uh, so before you got into, into Artifact, uh, had you already considered translating or trying to translate the MOBA game, so the Dota, League of Legends, whatever experience to card or tabletop format? Was this something that you've, you had been brewing uh, for a while? No. Uh, no, uh, the the birth of the artifact project was uh, was from uh, uh, making an electronic trading card game, uh, a digital trading card game, and uh, it was only later that we connected it to Dota. I've been a long time uh, fan of MOBAs, uh, but I hadn't really considered making a board game based on that. You you you've mentioned before in a, an interview that, that I've seen. I think it, I think it was with Slacks um, that you, you've seen in card games, uh, other uh, electronic card games, and you didn't feel that <clears throat> that awesomeness that you can get with paper cards. Uh, do you guys feel like what you did with Artifact achieved that? Uh, yes, ab absolutely. Uh, um, and I, I wouldn't necessarily characterize. I mean, there's some truth to that. Uh, uh, that it was lacking the oomph, but but I don't mean I don't mean to say that there haven't been really good online games. It's just that uh, it's just that the there was something that was uh, missing uh, relative to uh, the experience I had with paper games, with its uh, sort of uh, spectacular epic feel that you could sometimes get, because. Uh, online development has been so focused on trying to fit everything onto a small screen. And, uh, and, and so that was one of the things we were trying to get was this sort of epic uh, quality that, uh, that, was, that was gone. And, and anybody who plays uh, Artifact, I think, uh, a, a few times begins to, if they don't see it immediately, they begin to understand how this has a sort of an epic feel to it. The game has a, a very, uh, there's enough time in the play that you get a real arc uh, of building up and sort of a spectacular finish and it feels like there's a lot of meat there there's a lot of skill to play there's just a few things feel unbounded like you can get uh huge numbers of creatures and huge hands of cards uh so yeah i think uh, we did what we set out to do yeah one one thing is a lot of times you'll be playing artifact uh and you won't <clears throat> you won't actually want the game to end you know, there you could see online on Reddit or whatever. There are a bunch of complaints about people uh, quitting, you know, and uh, you know, resigning. I guess their position, and so it's always good to like. You, you sort of feel that the whole thing that Richard's talking about, like, oh, there's a plan coming together. I'm building a position. I'm gonna execute some pretty cool thing, and uh, so it's not bad that you're disappointed when they resign. It sort of shows how much you like the that particular game state. As opposed to, oh, I'm just playing to win or lose and move on to the next thing. Yeah, personally, 
I, I feel that you guys uh, achieved uh, that awesomeness that I normally, uh, at Fridays, I tend to play board, board games with my friends. Uh, my, my biggest problem with Artifact at the moment is that you guys kind of killed um, other digital trading card games for me. Because <laughs> I, I can't play Magic Online or Hearthstone anymore because all other trading card games that I played don't just... I don't know. There's something about Artifact that when you play it, all other card games just feel like dull. Yeah, that, that's actually that comment. Uh, th- there were there were several like uh, streamers that basically said the same thing. They eventually had to leave Artifact because they need to make money or whatever. But um, almost word for word, what you just said, like where it's like the other games just seem a little flat after they played this. So no, there there, there was something really special which uh, happened with Artifact with me. Uh, it's not my nature to uh to make a game with that many decisions over such a short period of time um i I usually like to sort of uh i'd be more inclined to go the if hearthstone didn't exist i would have gone down that path but uh as we played uh, uh artifact i began to realize that uh while people complained that this isn't Hearthstone. This is uh, there's just too much going on. I began to realize that, it, that that I wasn't really thinking of it as a trading card game in some ways. I was uh, thinking of it as a uh, a real time strategy game. Uh, and there's been a long time where I've really liked real time strategy games, but there's just too much micromanagement and clicking going on. And so this uh, this experience has allowed us to take. Uh, the grand strategy of uh, the it, in, in a game like uh, like a, a real time strategy game, and and put it into a card game in a way which uh, I hadn't thought was possible. Yeah, and I and I completely subscribe to what has been said. I I, I look at the other games on my computer and I just can't because. The, the feeling in Artifact is somehow that, is that you never get too far behind and there's always something that you could have done. And, uh, and that's just an amazing feeling. Now, a question that comes in the sequence of, of these points and that maybe it's obviously very abstract, but the game can be for, it's a great experience for the person who plays it. But if you're like a Twitch viewer or someone standing next to a friend playing the game, you often feel overwhelmed because obviously you're not inside the person's head and, and there's a lot going on. How do you feel as a game designer that you can take Artifact and maybe help the spectator, you know, get into the game uh, or understand what's going on, understand what are the, the key points and key decisions? Or Because, for example, Hearthstone is quite easy to just jump into and look and you, it's quite easy to understand what's going on and, and uh, understand what the current situation is. And Artifact, obviously, with the three-lane format and... Um, and what, uh, all the things that are going on, it uh, it can be daunting for the spectator to watch. Well, there's a couple things about that. Uh, one is I, I actually watch a lot of games. I watch more games than I play uh, because I feel like I'm better able to understand, you know, what other people are feeling uh, without getting as personally involved. Uh, Artifact is definitely difficult to spectate i think there's some things that can be done on the technical side i mean one is you would like to have a view as a spectator where you would be in control of moving around the board as opposed to just watching what someone else is doing um and that that's a that's a pretty big deal uh because it it lets you grasp things or if there were you know it's different if there were a professional event or something and and you could have that in control of the announcers just like the cameras for football. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's a, that, that's hard to do, uh, given, you know, the state of how do you spectate a game that's live without giving away too much information and that sort of thing. Um, so, so there, there's some technical consideration there, but mainly, you know, there's a lot of games that people like to watch a lot, you know, like football or basketball that are, you know, considerably more complicated than artifact. Uh, and they do just fine. I think you have to achieve a certain level of knowledge uh, about the game. Like if you're, I don't know, not a fan of cricket and you go try to watch cricket, <laughs> it, it seems awful. Uh, but yet, you know, there's a billion people that watch it all the time. Yeah. And the same thing with baseball or, you know, soccer, or American football. It, like it's, you know, usually these games that have a lot of depth to them, you, you know, we're asking something of these video games of like, 
I want to be able to spectate and have fun and not really know much about the game. And I don't know, that's just not really a burden that we tend to place on these other things. Like if you, you're going to get a deeper spectating experience if you are required to know the game first. So I, I think there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg thing going on. I, w- I will say that, that working with Valve, uh, it was uh, really uh, great seeing how much effort they put in uh, to try to in trying to make this complicated and deep game state as clear as possible. Uh, the, the just the years we worked with them were years of, uh, of figuring out how to show the uh, attack damage, uh, how to preview the fact that somebody was going to die, how to show that the base hit points were uh, were one thing and the current hit points were another, that uh, a, a, a creature had a special ability. Uh, they tinkered with this in so many different ways, and, uh, and, and they ended up with something where I think that the game state really, uh, you as, as Gaff said, you have to know the game to get pleasure out of watching, but that's any game. But they did a really good job, I think, of transmitting that if it, you know it. Yeah, if you if you actually think about what all is going on, it's a miracle of UI design <laughs> that you can even play this game. Yeah. It, really, it is. I mean, they're just just top notch. You know the the um, the UI work uh, that goes in. So it reminds me the people that play like three poker games at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So uh, obviously, Valve has a lot of experience in uh, in, in esports with uh, Counter Strike, with Dota, for example. So uh, obviously, there were major expectations regarding Artifact as an esport, and we were just talking about that as well. How that would potentially help people understand the game and follow the game. Scaff, you were you were the mastermind behind creating the Magic Pro Tour. Did you did you? Kind of receive uh, similar powers this time around, or oh n- uh, no, of course I didn't receive similar powers because the powers were uh, ridiculously exceptional when I was at Wizards of the Coast. Uh, basically, Richard cleared the way out uh, for me and a couple other people, um, you know, uh, at the executive level, and so yeah, no, we had, I, I mean something close to unlimited power. So that's never going to happen again. So no, I, I did not. Uh, it, but yeah, that, that should be expected that I would not. But, uh, but Valve did have uh, plans to create a major pro circuit or you were not involved, you have no idea or? Uh, you know, we, uh, certainly we, we had plans. Um, yeah, uh, you know, there were designs. And so that was uh, er- earlier on. I mean, you know, whatever, before launch. Yeah, things changed. Yeah, so I wanted to uh, to jump jump back to to game design and um, talk a little bit about about RNG because this was always a major point of discussion in the community, you know, regarding artifact and was cited often cited as one of the reasons why the game kind of did not uh, did not have a lot of success. Um, and obviously, you guys have written books, given presentations about it, and it's been your job uh, to think about these topics for quite a while. Um, on a personal lo- note, for me, what seems to happen sometimes with Artifact is that there's a lot of in- in- instances of RNG and you often get this feeling that the last instance that you lost was was game-defining, kind of, even though, you know, you had you had dozens of, uh, of instances during the game, you cannot help but feel bad about it. And obviously, RNG has two uh, sides, so someone wins and someone loses, and uh, we're kind of programmed to feel... Uh, to 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 forget about the good ones and and kind of have uh, bad feelings about or feel traumatic experiences about the the bad ones. So, as as uh, as professional game designers, what's your perception of these events of these RNG events and uh, and kind of what techniques do you use to minimize these negative feelings that the player might experience? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Richard sometimes differentiates between you know how much RNG is in there and how much RNG it feels like there's in there. Uh, and so that it, that's a pretty big deal. Uh, I think Artifact certainly feels like it has more RNG than it does. Like when you look at the ELO rating spread of the player population, uh, it's, it's astounding. It's, I mean, I, I mean, even after the first couple of weeks, it was, you know, 
a thousand point spread or more. And the thing is that that's um, sort of, I, I guess, in some demonstrable way, can more skill testing than magic uh, even. And, and that was with just one game matches, you know, from the general server, not even best two out of three. So like on a, I, I guess on a, some sort of provable level, you could see, you could see that it has uh, much less RNG than cert than any other card game that I know of. Um, but that doesn't, that doesn't matter if people don't feel that. I, I think the biggest thing is like, I don't know, like replays. So you can analyze, analyze, you know, what you did. Um, and, and people can go back and, you know, you can say, oh, okay, well, I got screwed by RNG. And then, okay, you know, post the replay. And then you go back and you look and you'll have 50 people telling you where you made your mistakes. So. Do you, do you kind of feel that people interact differently with like digital RNG versus f flipping a coin or rolling a die or that the feelings that people, f you know, being alone here in front of my computer, I might experience RNG or negative RNG uh, differently in, in comparison to maybe... Uh, actually, I, I, I don't think so. Like a lot of people for a long time thought of poker as just tons of RNG. And then there was a culture change, you know, that took decades before people, now people generally respect that poker has a lot of skill, but it's not, it's like night and day compared to, I don't know, you know, 1990 to 2010, somewhere in there, the perception of the amount of skill in poker, uh, in the general populace just completely flipped. And, um, well, even if uh, Texas Hold'em is the same. Part, part of the, problem is that people uh, confuse uh, RNG with skill. Uh, oftentimes there can be a lot of both. There's a lot of luck in poker, but there's a lot of skill. People understand that now, but as Scaff said, that's taken a long time. Uh, and uh, there's uh, a lot of RNG in a game like Artifact, but there's a lot of skill too. You can measure the skill by looking at uh, how often the more skillful people win, which is very, very often. Uh, there's a story from early days with Magic where we were doing a um, sealed deck, and uh, and and there was a a, a, a the French team, I believe, that uh, that said they hated playing sealed deck because it's all luck and they always lose. Yeah, right. Those are. Uh, um, <laughs> I have a lot of friends that say that still. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so um, yeah so what do you do with that you know so that that's a perception problem mostly that, re that reminds me of nine saying when i win it's very skill intensive when i lose it's oh man i'm so unlucky <laughs> yeah, but, yeah yeah and absolutely I, I i um actually think that uh that 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 is a part of the problem here is the game is different enough uh, from what is out there, that people have trouble uh, internalizing where the luck and skill is. And the uh, a lot of the people who might otherwise be movers in the game play a few times and lose a few times, and they see the luck and they say it's all RNG. Whereas if, uh, if there was broader play of it, they would quit the game whining, and, uh, and then later on, you know, uh, there would be a community of people that uh, that that would be vouching for the fact that uh, that that they lost actually because they weren't playing skillfully, which is something which they can't even imagine, uh, and uh, and uh, and maybe they'd find their way back to the game. Yeah, I, I watched Twitch streamer after Twitch streamer. You know, the lower level ones, not the not the top guys, where you know they're just making so many mistakes, and then they complain about RNG for their loss. You know, it, it's um, it's definitely something I think we were. Well, at least I can say I was surprised by uh, how much um, work we really needed to do that we didn't do explaining to people how much skill there is in the game. Yeah, a lot of people uh, have a hard time processing all the, the decisions and the RNG and how you need to decide and think around the RNG that can happen, the arrows and how the creeps will land, etc. I, I don't know, guys. I guess a lot of people are just used to easy games. Yeah. Well, yeah. It also, you know, the RNG. This is another thing that that you know. It's an interesting point. It's not true that increasing the amount of RNG in the game, uh, which again, there's a lot. In, there's a lot of RNG and there's a lot of skill. 
it's not true that increasing the RNG definitely uh, automatically decreases the skill in the game. And in fact, it can increase it. You know, like in whatever, I don't know, poker, if you're able to choose your opening hand uh, and you just pick a pair of aces, uh, again, Texas Hold'em, and you pick a, oh, I'll have pocket aces all the time. Um, that probably has, there's a, probably a lot less skill in that game, you know, because it's whatever, a tie or toss up uh, every time. And so um, it's, it's the, the fact and artifact that you have so many different possible situations to consider, not just from game to game, but from turn to turn, uh, makes it makes it really something where um, the, you know it, it gives the more skilled players an edge over the long run. Yeah, it's it's the, you you get a lot of uh, skill testing, which is uh, made available by a, a good application of RNG. Uh, one of the things you get these days, which uh, is much more prominent than when uh, when I was growing up, is uh, where you get this monolithic groupthink of how a game should be played, the the meta strategy. This is what you should be doing, and uh, and uh, if you follow that, uh, there's a lot of people who will get very good at playing that way. And uh, if you follow it, uh, you'll get a lot of uh, uh, a lot of benefit from the masses, so to speak. And if you try to fight against the meta, even if it's not necessarily the best way to play, it's hard because a lot of people know really ha very well how to play the meta. And, and so you're fighting uh, a, a solid strategy probably against people who know what they're doing and it puts you downhill. So it means that this monolithic uh, uh, idea of how you should play the game will dominate. RNG, what that can allow you to do is it, it mixes things up that you don't always fall in the same place every time. And so you end up uh, with new situations. Uh, it's not, uh, it's, it's uh, not going to be a, a cookie cutter re uh, uh, repeat of what happened last time. It can't be because the game spins off into unforeseen situations and the person who's best able to deal with that will, will be the, uh, the victor more often than not. Yeah, I believe that that's what they call the hive mind thinking in magic is kind of the, the hive mind decides something and then uh, you kind of have to follow it or uh, or you're not part of it. Yeah. yeah. I would I would kind of like to to ask a bit of a mean question, but uh, how how would you kind of how would you kind of rate artifact against all other games that you've designed in the past um if 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 that's something that you can do? Well, uh, it's 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 often hard to compare because it's apples and oranges. Uh, but uh, um, I, I uh, so so it's hard for me to compare uh, artifact, for example, to King of Tokyo or or Hive Mind, mm -hmm. for that matter. Um, and, and but but I can to some extent compare it to other trading card games, and I think it's uh, uh, I, I think it's uh, in many ways the most solid. Uh, design that I've uh, contributed to in uh, trading card games. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of reasons why uh, it it sort of stands out. Uh, um, it's hard to beat Magic for its uh, um, sort of place in history and the amount that I got correct, uh, even sometimes through intuition or dumb luck. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, Artifact the uh, just has something really special going on with uh, again one of our uh, one of the things we were after was we want to make something that feels epic and uh, and um, and I, I really think we succeeded in doing that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with Richard. It's right up there. I mean, again, there's always a difference between how happy are you with the game as versus how happy are you with the product. So obviously, you can't. You can't say, oh, it, as a product, it, it, you know, it, it wasn't as successful as we would have liked. But the game design, I think, is, is, is uh, exceptional, right, right near the top sure. of the stuff that Three Donkeys has done or that I've seen Richard do. So end November last year, the game comes out. Um, over the last four, four and a half months, the, guy, the game basically lost most of its uh, player base. There are uh, there were some interesting surveys um, that some Reddit users uh, conducted, and I, one of them at least got like a couple of thousand people to answer it regarding the features and the monetization and balance of the game. 
it, it seemed from that information that magic players such as me, so I kind of I kind of <laughs> see myself in that data, um, seems to be kind of overall more satisfied. Um, and so my question to you is, do you ever think that your personal experience in the past with magic and so on, also your maturity and your age may have kind of biased uh, the game design towards an audience that is, uh, you know, that has been following you uh, with magic and, and so on. And that kind of like newer generations, newer audiences, maybe just kind of don't identify as much with, with the concepts uh, that uh, you put forth for, for Artifact? Uh, I think, I mean, I think if anything, uh, having a, 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 an understanding of the history of games that goes back you know, much further than magic is beneficial. There's a, a, a lot of really interesting game mechanics that happened uh, that have evolved over our history uh, as human beings. Um, uh, and and I, I don't think uh, that the game, uh, I think that the game would be uh, uh, received just if you, if, if, uh, ooh, I lost where I was going with this. <laughs> you, yeah, like, anyway, but I, I think I would have liked to have seen, like on that, on the Reddit thing, well, first of all, let me say, it's a Reddit survey, so okay. already it's pretty highly filtered. Yeah, it does not reflect um, every, everyone, obviously. Right. Now, it may reflect people that like it better than the average person. I don't know, but I'm just saying it. You really have to consider strongly um, the, the source there. Uh, a more general survey uh, would be interesting to compare. Um, but, like, I would have liked to have seen, like, okay, who here has played, you know, a sport in high school or who here has played poker? Or who here has played chess? You know, uh, I mean, you know, uh, consider themselves a chess player, not have played it once, or consider themselves a basketball player, not have played it once, or a mad or a poker player, etc. Um, I, th I th that would have been interesting because I think a lot of those things would have correlated, uh, probably along the same lines that Magic did. So to answer your first question. I think it's always a danger, right? Like you always need to be thinking that you are behind the times. Uh, you know, really, uh, you know, you say how, our experience or whatever, but at every age, you know, unless you're 12 years old and designing a <laughs> Roblox game, you um, you really need to question, see if, if you're behind the times or not. But uh, so. One of the reasons that that sounds, uh, feels uh, that it, that it feels weird to me is that uh, is that uh, artifact is so different than a game like Magic. Um, I mean, they're both trading card games, but the but the feel you get playing Artifact is, as I mentioned earlier, it's closer to uh, the feel you get playing a real time strategy game than a card game in a lot of ways. It's like it's been slowed down enough that you can actually uh, uh, play it. Uh, but but it still feels like like you don't finish. I finish an artifact game. I'm sometimes sweating. Uh, I rarely play a magic game where I end up sweating. Yeah, it's also even among the card games, it's probably closer to like Gwent than it is Magic. I mean, it's hard to say, but you know, I think I think it probably is. Uh, the one thing that the Magic players are definitely more used to than any of the other people is the revenue model. So, That's true, and 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 since I I believe that the game, uh, 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 that 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 the major hitch in the game was not due to game design, which I'm always uh, very fast to blame blame design for uh, uh, a game I make not doing what it needs to do, but but I in this case I really think it's uh, there's a lot of stuff outside of game design which is uh, is is what's failed, what made it fail to reach the audience i think it has a chance of appealing to yeah i i think i can verify that richard is super self-critical uh which is what makes him great as a game designer and then the other thing is that you know we preached for years and years and years that the game was the metagame you know for magic like it's not when you come to the it's true for every game but especially trading card games when you come to the table you know it's very you have to have blinders on to think that people are just playing the game. It's the social setting. It's the tournament structure. It's the trading. It's the 
you know, everything combined, uh, that's really, you know, makes the product. Yeah. Uh, you guys were talking about a very important uh, fact is, it, is it, it's the revenue, the player, the magic players were more used to the way it worked. Uh, was, was the way that the economics in the game and the revenue model, was it something that you guys like, uh, was it, uh, how, how do I put this? Was this something that Valve and you guys came together? Was it like the way you thought the game would be, did you think you would apply the same rules that we, you, when you have like paper cards, was this something like Valve said, we have to have a market inside the game, like all other games that we have? How did um, the economics decisions work here? We all, we all certainly did it together, and Valve was not demanding anything. You know, they were certainly open to everything. We all, both Valve and us, thought there was a great opportunity because of the Steam Marketplace to do an actual, you know, real trading card game. Uh, but nothing was set in stone, and we absolutely helped uh, with some of the decisions on the revenue models. Valve uh, maintained a really player-oriented focus, um, and so there's been a lot of uh, a lot a lot of the stuff was uh, that, that that I've read about is oh, Valve's being greedy for this for that. That working with them is never uh, the case. At least uh, you know, like they sometimes uh, they may have made the wrong decision, or we have made may have, may have made the wrong decision, but it was always. Uh, focused on what uh, what they thought was best for the player. Yeah, don't don't get my. Yeah, and the same with us. Exactly. Don't don't get the question wrong. Um, I, <laughs> no. the, the way I was asking uh, this so, is because I know that you guys are, are really strongly uh, against Skinnerware. I myself, I'm not really a big fan of that, but I know that most of the games that Valve has, like you look at CS:GO, you look at Dota. All they got is like they sell those little uh, cosmetics and those uh, weapons with little funny skins. Uh, and that's something that I know you guys are not really fans of. Uh, and therefore, when we started seeing the, the boosters with cards um, and not just cosmetics and everyone having uh, like the free collection, that's why I was asking if the way that the economics were designed was, were you like, guys, well, we got to make boosters with cards because that's the the way that trading card games uh, kind of work and let's not pick up like cosmetics well, uh, and stuff like you've been I mean, doing uh, in the other games. I, I feel like we had a voice in what was going on but we weren't the final say uh we thought that there was a lot that the marketplace could bring um i think that the idea of not selling cosmetics is is it that it's it's more nuanced than uh, just not liking uh, cosmetics. I think cosmetics are great in games. Um, uh, the the thing which I don't like to see is when uh, when the, the 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 only people who are providing money are uh, are people who are vulnerable to uh, uh, certain types of Skinnerware abuse. And that doesn't necessarily mean that that the the game could entirely run by cosmetics, uh, and as long as uh, uh, you know, you, you don't start looking at the at, at where the payment is coming from and look and see, oh, the reason, you know, the payment is coming from 1% of the audience and they're spending $10,000 each. Uh, that sort of smacks of something which is going wrong. Uh, but if it's, a, you know, a reasonable number of people are spending a, 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 an amount which is commensurate with the amount of time they're putting into the game, then that's fine. I, I completely agree uh, with with that. And uh, what I thought was interesting, you know, observing this as a, as an outsider, as a, just as a player, observing what happens to me, I could not help but feel, um, like I said, I'm quite happy with the monetization. I come from Magic. I see it as as normal that you play to, to that you pay to play something that you want to have fun with. But um, it really seems like Dota players and people in general nowadays kind of expect games to be free. And so if these whales, these players who spend a lot of money, if they represent 1% or 5% of the population, it kind of seems like you have 95% of the population pushing towards free is the way to go and we want it this way because, because that's how my other games are and so I want this game to be the same. Well, I think it's, you know, it's not, I don't, I don't think the free thing is quite as important. I mean, you know, obviously before Fortnite, PUBG was pretty successful, like ridiculously successful. And, uh, and, 
and it would be the Fortnite of today if it hadn't, you know, had Fortnite not come out as free. But people didn't mind paying the upfront fee for that. Uh, and the same thing with a lot of Valve's games, you know, where you have to pay. I mean, Dota's not like this, but, you know, a lot of their other ones, when they were very successful, you know, or even still now, uh, you would pay, you know, a small upfront fee. So I, I don't I don't really think the the one-time fee is necessarily... Obviously, you're going to reach less people initially. That's not as big a, a, a deal breaker as the ongoing, you know, uh, payments, I think. Just given you know other games that you can see, do you feel like this is something that needs to change? Well, something needs to change, right? Uh, so, I, I again, I don't, I don't really know. If you go and you look at the comments that people make when they're giving it negative reviews, there, there's a, a, the number one complaint by far is the is the is the revenue model. So that would be probably the first place that you would think again, if you're coming from the outside and you just didn't know anything and you were just reading about it, it seems like that is what the massive outcry is against. So I, I would guess, yes, that would need to change. Although, you know, if, if 95% of the people are demanding a free game, uh, I mean, I, I am perfectly happy making a game for the other 5%. Right. That's um, true. And uh, uh, the question is wh whether you actually reach that 5%. Uh, the negative uh, vitriol from the 95% who demand a free game uh, has pushed away a lot of those, the 5% the who are willing to pay for a quality game uh, at uh, what I think is a reasonable price. It, 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 uh, one thing I will say that kind of shocked me was the reviews um, where it would get a, say, a one-star review, and then you would read the review, and the complaint was just about the price. Like, it, it, it is odd, you know, where you could take, oh, it seems like that sort of people, like the best restaurants in the world, like absolutely the best restaurants in the world would all get, you know, zero stars. Why? Because of the price. It just, that's an odd thing, at least for me, uh, how those two things weren't broken out. Sometimes you'd read the, read the review and it was more nuanced and they would say, oh, I like the game, I hate the thing, but you'd have to read the review. If you just glanced at it, it would, you, know, you would see a, a very low rating. So, uh, so th this goes to what Richard's saying. If, if I'm willing to pay the price and I'm in that 5% and I go and I look at the reviews and it's got a 20% rating or whatever, then I'm going to say, well, okay, I don't want to buy it. But if the reviews were yeah. separated out with like great game, too expensive, then you might want to buy it if you're in that top, uh, if you're in that top group of people willing to pay. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it, it's very interesting because at a glance, you wouldn't know that from looking at the vast majority of the aggregations on the reviews. Yeah, and also just um, just uh, as a, as an experience, I went back to see reviews now that some time is gone and most people are not playing the game anymore. And a lot of those reviews also come from players who did not play that much, I have to say, because if you've only played the game for half an hour and then you have a top review on Steam, you're just influencing a lot of people without maybe experiencing, without giving the game a chance. Kind sure. Of, I would say. And, and, and I will say that that is, you know, uh, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that's kind of our fault or Val's fault or whatever, like, is just the management of that situation. Um, I, I had no idea. Like it, it, it really caught me by surprise the extent of it. Yeah. Yeah. The, I mean, it, it's even worse than what you said, right? Because they played for half an hour. There were a lot of people who expressly bought the game because they wanted to give it a low review and then refunded it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, yeah. Like, again, I don't, I still view it as that's, that's, we made a mistake somehow. There's something we could have done you know, to, uh, to deal with that or prevent that rather than, than the other people. We just, I think, I, at least I personally was caught unprepared for that sort of thing. You obviously have a, um, you know, this background with, with the organized play, with a pro play in Magic. There's a, actually an interview with you and Bruno where you talk about, you know, your plan to kind of move away from lathers. Um, and at the end, the ticket queue system was uh, obviously not uh, particularly well received. In your view, how would the move towards the system 
you know, that's rewarding look like in the future? Do you think Artifact is kind of destiny, destined to go the same way as Magic Arena and Hearthstone? Uh, it, it might be. I mean, the ticket system is uh, obviously a lot of people are against that. I, I think with other games, like, again, I relate everything back to, uh, you know, Magic. That's the thing that I know best. And so when people would play events that they had to pay for there, that was always a better deal than just buying the cards. You know, and that was kind of important at the local store draft level or whatever. And so I think that 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 was not the case with Artifact. And so uh, you weren't, you know, I, I think that might be part of um, part of what I would change if if uh, it, looking back in retrospect, like the making it more like uh, like the paper based games where it's sort of a ticket, but it's sort of like just a discount on buying product. You know, and and also sure. Richard was really big on distributing the um, the things a little more softer for that sort of thing. So like, even if you're you know losing or just winning only one game, you might get more of a potential benefit. I kind of I kind of feel the mentality nowadays. If you look at other games, uh, let's 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 talk about like AAA games from other companies, uh, and not trading cards uh, specifically. Uh, most of the games that have like stores to, to buy, be it cosmetics, be it items, be it whatever, the, nowadays most games just allow you to win those uh, items by itself by playing the game. Uh, you see this by, uh, on other games where, you, for example, uh, you played X hours or you reach level X and you'll get a reward. Eventually, uh, the update that came out on January, I think, May people win some boosters and some tickets, but only until level like 16, if I'm not uh, incorrect. And when th when that came out, people uh, seemed to be very, very happy with the system, uh, get rewarding them for leveling up. But my question is, why only until level 16? Why, why didn't it keep giving you stuff until later on? Oh, uh, well, I, I wasn't like directly involved in that, but I mean, I think it's sort of easy to answer is that if you can just continually win cards, you know, this is not like cosmetics in another game. If you can just continually win cards, then you're, that's basically your Skinner where you're right back to the cards are worthless. They don't have a monetary value to them. So why would you pay for them? You know, that, that's the general philosophy. You, you certainly need to cap the amount that people can get by playing for free, w which is different by the way, than having some sort of like a, you know, uh, expectation that you're not really getting them for free, but you're getting them at a massive discount, but you still have to pay for them if you play. Makes mm -hmm. sense. You know, like a magic booster draft or whatever. Then you can, you can run those as much as you want, and you're just sort of reducing the price of your product, but you're still making people pay for it. How did, how did you see the, the rise of uh, Dota Auto Chess? Because a lot of these concepts kind of, uh, you kind of see that in that game, and, and it's just... Uh, kind of a little bit of a lottery where people have a lot of fun and they can quit whenever they want and it just had a massive success and people were kind of saying this is what artifact should have been right yeah and no dota auto chess is great i mean i, I don't know it's just a it's just a really really great thing so uh it's it's hard to compare the two right because obviously there's certainly um you know the one's free to play and the other's not etc so but no, I, I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good game. It's not a, obviously, like a trading card game. So that's, uh, which is what we set out to make. Yeah, it's sure. completely different. Uh, it's a little bit, so in other words, it's a little bit apples and oranges. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to take you guys back to end December, I believe. Valve put out the news that they were changing kind of their approach to the game. They had initially planned not to nerf or buff cards. And they wanted to avoid changing with cards as much as possible. But uh, you know, after massive outcry, they decided to uh, eventually nerf cards such as Draw Ranger, Cheating Death, and Axe. Uh, I wanted to, guy, to, to ask how you guys followed this development and how you kind of feel about it and kind of what you think were the major advantages and disadvantages of uh, trying to not change cards compared to, you know, like a systematic approach of well, the, uh, uh In general, we like to uh, let the play community figure their way around problems. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why uh, 
Axe and Cheating Death, for example, are not game-breaking cards. We had play-tested with them for uh, for many years, and uh, and there were lots of interesting uh, decks and play that came out from those cards, and a lot of different ways that the meta evolved to deal with them, and a lot of uh, different roles that they played in keeping the meta healthy. Um, and uh, and so and so if every time people complain, you uh, you you change the game to meet their expectations, then it becomes something more like I tried something, it didn't work, wah, and then the designer, you know, the, then the publisher uh, tweaks some numbers, and now what they try works. Uh, so it's it's not for me a very healthy environment necessarily. Uh, on the other hand, the you know, it's like the uh, uh, there there were there were some reasons for them to uh, be trying a lot of things. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the game when it was launched uh, had a lot of people leaving and they were looking for any excuses that could be there. Now, personally, uh, I don't think that was, uh, that the, 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 the main problem was uh, the game design, but uh, that was on the table for what they wanted to fix. And one way to fix the game design is by fixing the cards. Yeah, it's interesting. Even at the state of the nerfs, there was a tournament run for cash right around that time that didn't the the winning parts of it weren't even uh, egregious. You know, um, didn't have an egregious use of those cards. So like it, it, it sort of even before they had made the actual nerf, already the metagame uh, was shifting away from those things. And of course, you'll never know where it would have ended up. I, I'm not saying in the long run that, you know, we a hundred percent know if something would have needed to be nerfed or not, but that particular round of nerfs, it was, you know, demonstrable that it, that there was a whole nother metagame uh, cycle shift that was going to take place pre nerf. So uh, yeah, like Richard said, was it, was it necessary from a gameplay perspective? No, but, uh, it it may well have been the right move just to keep just to keep people happy given the state of the game, right? And 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 that that certainly is uh, uh they got it appeared they got a lot of goodwill from the changes, yep. and so you know is that worth it? Uh, yeah, it, it certainly could be, and so uh, uh and, and and so uh and again as I will always say you know Valve is focused. Uh, the, the the people we were working with was focused on what you know what the best thing for the players was right and and sometimes you have to make compromises to salvage the community because again you even if the gameplay shouldn't change uh, you, you can't look at it that way you have to look at it as the whole experience of you know keeping Reddit happy and keeping people happy and the social structures and everything like it's it's really all mixed together so. Um, Another thing I'll say, though, is that changing the balance on the cards is something that is extremely friendly to uh, people that play a lot, uh, but don't necessarily maybe um, that aren't necessarily maybe at the very top level. And it is it, it's not just that you're trying to protect people's investment in cards which I think is how it was perceived. Like, oh, you don't want to nerf and buff and nerf cards because, um, because it's, uh, you know, you're trying to preserve this money monetary system. Yeah. It's also protecting people's investment in their strategies. So like with Magic, you know, you can go back to Magic and you can pick up a deck you played 20 years ago and, and, and you know how it works. And you may not know how new things work if you're playing it against a more modern thing, but but stuff doesn't, doesn't really change uh and even from time to time you don't have to keep up with what the latest things are you know the, yeah. the strategies um evolve more slowly now the thing is of course that's all friendly to the casual player and to the long-term player the 10-year player the 20-year player and, and we really were thinking of this game as you know lasting that long uh and so it's just when you're when you're making the constant changes it's a little more um it's a little more geared toward harder core players and people that are very like uh, 
you know, currently involved in the game. Yeah. Were you potentially also expecting maybe the next expansion to deal with some of the problems that people raised or some of the theoretical meta problems? Yes. In fact, yeah. In fact, some of the things that were done were, were things that were, uh, grabbed from the, the next expansion, the, the, uh, the artifact that, uh, um, purge the purging effect on the artifact ah. oh, the item i mean sorry mm -hmm. so obviously the plans have changed but um were you kind of um expecting the game to to be healthy up until january february and then hit us um <laughs> with the set or at, at kind of at which point did you guys sit down and say well we cannot release something it's not worth it because it's interesting from us on our side to think, uh, like, when did they gave up on 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 releasing new, the new set? Or obviously, uh, you'd, you'd have to ask them. I mean, uh, the sets. I think I think it's known that it was designed. Uh, so, mm -hmm. my personal opinion is I, I don't I don't understand why they would when I say they the team involving the the artifact doing nerfs in a core set is just so out of my mind to do that because that's why that's that's why expansions <laughs> exist i mean yes there will always be power cards there will always be power creep cards coming in the next expansion people would be annoyed at one or two cards now but that's 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 just how it is there's always power cards and the next expansion will <laughs> make people forget about those cards or have other cards that put other cards in check i i just uh, when that when the when the nerfs came i was like why the game's like one month and a half it sure yeah i know i mean it was a signal right to you know as you see on your reddit chart there's all sorts of different players right it's a probably a negative signal to magic players uh and a positive signal to dota players or whatever so it's just um some people kind of expect it i think people in general expect uh games to be less balanced than artifact probably was so their inclination is to think, oh, it must be a balance issue. It should be fixed by balancing stuff uh, as opposed to releasing more cards or whatever. So it, again, it's really about managing the, the player expectations. Mm -hmm. So, so and, this whole ordeal um, kind of uh, led to you guys, you know, ceasing collaboration for now, at least. Um, and uh, I kind of no, uh, it wanted to, yeah, it, go for you it. Know, so. It was, we, yeah, we were, we were brought in to, design the game and design, you know, tournament system or whatever. That's what we do. That's like generally what we do. And we had, you know, sort of completed that. And so, uh, I don't, I don't know that it was, uh, yeah. I mean, at some point you're, you, you finished your job kind of thing. How, how was it emotionally for you guys to, to follow what happened and, you know, maybe read reviews and uh, Reddit and so on? How, um, how was the, the emotional experience? Obviously, you've had other games that maybe were not super successful, but after four years of working on this product with a lot of expectations, how did it feel for you guys? Oh, well, there, there's certainly a, a, an amount of heartbreak there uh, in, uh, uh, in, in how it got received in that way. Uh, it also felt... Like, uh, there's, there's, uh, games I've made where, like, uh, one game I made a couple years ago, Spynet. Uh, I really think it's a solid design and was very frustrated it didn't get more traction. It's just a standalone card game. So, uh, so sort of, uh, uh, in a different, uh, area. But, but this felt, uh, different than that. I, I felt like, uh, uh, I couldn't get, the, uh, enough people to try SpyNet. It was just it was hard to get notice in such a busy game environment. Uh, here it was different. We had notice, but uh, there was this this uh, this basically uh, massive rating bomb, which made it so that the five percent of people, if that's what it was, who would have been interested in the game and would have been really interested in the game, that a good chunk of them never looked at it because of the uh, of the uh, negative uh, uh, opinions that were being uh, expressed. Yeah. 
Um, and it's really unfortunate that people behave the way they do nowadays in the internet, but um, it's something that yeah, companies have to deal with. Yeah. So how do you see yourself, uh, yourselves um, in what concerns Artifact's future? Do you, do you still feel like you have a say? Do you kind of expect to, to come back and, uh, and do you expect the game to still succeed? Or, or what's your expectation at the moment? Uh, we don't have any like direct plans to come back. They, they can always bring us back whenever. I mean, that, that's, you know, at the end of the day, it's their game and we just consult. So, um, so we wouldn't, we certainly wouldn't say no, but again, as I mentioned before, we we've done a lot of the work that we were hired to do. So I don't, I don't know that that's likely, uh, going forward. Um, and I, I don't know, Valve has a really good track record with games. So despite where it is now, I, I don't think it, Certainly, I would not count it out. I mean, uh, I I, th I think there's a really good chance it'll still be a success because Valve Valve's really good at at putting the time and the effort in over the long run. And 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 also, uh, there is something unique uh, about the underlying design that I think has uh, a lot of merit. And so, extra time out there, it's you know, Valve's got something to work with there if they uh, if they uh, choose to do that, which uh, I, I think they will, and uh, and in the long run, that may you know that may come out to a broader audience. Right. I mean, there's stuff about the revenue model, right, that they could change. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do, but um, but yeah, like they have a lot of a lot to work with. Mm -hmm. But I, as a quick example, when the game first came out, we weren't really sure like what the elo rating spread would be as a, as an example like we don't we didn't really know how skill testing it would be for that particular uh audience and so like we we were very pleasantly surprised at um at at the amount of skill in the game and so despite the fact that the audience never got to you know experience that really so what good is it but it's it's like it gives you the ability to you know, create the tournament system and stuff like that. That'll have the multiple levels and whatever. That's just one example. As Richard says, the game design itself is another example. And so you, you get these like, I don't know, there's a lot of material to work with there. Yeah, I, I mean, there's there's two common complaints, which are both demonstrably uh, uh, not true. Uh, uh, and, and so time may see their undoing. One is that that, uh, there's too much RNG, um, and too much RNG again gets conflated with how much skill there is. That's oftentimes what they mean. There is demonstrably a lot of skill to this game, more than uh, I would say any of its peers. Uh, the other thing, which uh, uh, is just incorrect, is that uh, the game is you know designed to be super expensive. It's actually to buy to buy it is much cheaper than magic or and if you want to buy a uh, a competitive deck in hearthstone much cheaper than hearthstone um, definitely and uh and yeah uh you can't play for free uh or you couldn't uh but uh um but uh but if you're interested in being a competitive player it's just it's a, a relative to uh what it's offering it's it's uh you know very modestly priced yeah, that's true you you can buy well now it's not a good comparison time but you can now buy like the the whole set for less than a hundred dollars and if you're going to play magic or even hearthstone for example you need like 400 or 500 dollars to buy the full collection yeah yeah the uh um the other thing i mean there there uh the marketplace was uh w one of the things which brought me to brought us to valve in the first place and uh the value that uh, you get from that as a player the fact that you can uh um sell cards and buy cards uh and so that the market sort of takes care of itself makes it like that's a that's a uh, uh a way to keep the game inexpensive while still having uh having it so that uh, um there's a, a a lot of uh, uh, different things that can be purchased um, because uh, uh, yeah you can uh, uh, you can have you can move your investment around uh, and uh, to play whatever strategy you like you don't have to buy everything uh, a game where you can't trade cards that is not the case yeah do you, do you guys do you guys feel that with this new overhaul that we we're going to experience in the game according to Valve 
Do you guys feel that the game will profit from a new beta testing phase? Because um, most people, uh, I, th- I don't know if complain is the correct word here, but a lot of people talk that the, the, the initial beta for Artifact uh, was very small, only like pro players were invited or very few other non-pro players. The, the common, the common uh, message around on, on the internet is like, if more normies were allowed to, to play the beta, maybe more uh, feedback would be given and, and not the, just the, the people that play this nonstop. Yeah, it, it's actually hard for a trading card game because um, because unlike other games, when you're, uh, you know, well, first of all, you're asking people to purchase the cards, you either have to charge them or you aren't getting, you know, proper results. So that's one that's one thing. Like the, it's a huge difference between the beta test, which was very successful, and uh, and the real world uh, was not charging, uh, and and that's really difficult to do in a beta. And the second thing is, trading card games need new cards coming in in a non stale environment, and so um, and so again, it's hard to have a long. You know, a lot of these games are, well, everyone calls themselves in a beta, but they have a real beta period for six months or a year. It's kind of hard to do that for a trading card game because um, because you need new cards. It's very expensive to make new cards, but in terms of you know research time and you know the the um, the visuals that go into them and everything like that. So it, it is more. It's just it's more challenging game to beta test than a first person shooter or you know whatever in terms of the length of time. I will say one one of the things that interests me most uh, uh, about the uh, larger beta uh, for longer, um, uh, while I, I think that there's a lot of difficulties with this game in particular because of the revenue because of because of the revenue and because of uh, the fact that you want the game to evolve and you're sort of running up against those, but is not getting more normies involved so we can hear their feedback, but getting more and more normies involved so that they can begin understanding how the game works. Uh, because uh, Yes, that's a good like, point. And, and uh, sorry, let me, uh, in Artifact, you know, you don't need to play with the full card set. You know, you can give people draft and stuff like that. And that has a much longer shelf life than, um, than constructed. So like if you had a beta test and you scaled it over, you know, even just a couple months filled with normies, as Richard's saying, where they don't have to put money in, so you don't have to charge them. You don't have to balance the full card set or have them know what the full card set balance is. You can have them play, you know, like, hey, just play with the common cards or now do a draft or now do, um, you know, a, a pre-con deck. Like, even just doing that for, um, you know, a month or two gets, like Richard said, it gets people to understand the game before they're asked to pay for the game. We know that uh, Valve is a company that is kind of, uh, I guess the developers are kind of perfectionists. So they, they probably give everything they've got, but, uh, but they tend to want to take, a, take their time to make things really be the way they want. Having worked with them these past few years, and uh, now that we know that this, this, this new rework will take a significant amount of time, the way they put it, how long do you kind of expect that this rework will take? Oh, wow. I, I don't really know because I'm not there anymore. You know, I haven't been there for quite a while, three months or something like that, four months. And so uh, so I, I, I really couldn't say. I know that they they do tend to be perfectionists. They never, Valve never puts out something that's, you know, cruddy. I mean, they're, they're just, they're basically just excellent. So, um, so I don't, I don't really know. Uh, anything about what their timeline is or what their qualifications are before something passes a bar that they would release. So I, I, you'd have to ask them. Yeah. Um, I, I, the only thing I'll say is it, it apparently it won't be like super soon because they just made that announcement not too long ago. So obviously if they were a week away, they wouldn't have made that. Announcement, right. I mean, yeah. That's just, just from the outside, just some sort of logical perspective. I would expect it would be at least a little while, you know, yeah, let's just hope it's like summer and not next Christmas again. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But it would be hard for it to be, I mean, again, given just purely logical from the outside, because I don't really know, it would be hard for it to be before summer, right? Yeah, it makes sense, because like summer's in two months and they announce it like one month. It's it's really hard. Yeah, right. If it, if it was like a week away, they would have the announcement would have been like, 
hey, it's coming in a week or something. It wouldn't have been, we're taking some time to do a deeper dive. And I guess if you want to be strategic about it, then you might just want to wait for Christmas again, potentially. Possibly. I, I don't really know. I would just, yeah. Sorry. Sure. <laughs> The easiest kind of question is one where I just say, I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so let's imagine that you guys could go back in time, talk to yourselves four years back. Are there any tips that you'd kind of uh, give yourself now if you were just beginning to work on Artifact? Is there anything that, uh, that you'd like to maybe go back and do differently? Well, I, I'd certainly tell, tell my four-year-old self uh, um, uh, uh, the, the story of its launch uh, and uh, let him figure out uh, what to do about it. <laughs> yeah, that's basically, you know, th that's not really specific advice. It's more, you know, general advice. Like hindsight is 2020. Obviously, it's hard to say, but like if you said like, hey, if you just go ahead and you just throw this thing out there, it's going to, you know, maybe, maybe not fail, but the launch will fail. You know, uh, who's to say? Maybe it'll be a success. We're certainly all hoping that um but without a doubt unequivocally the launch was a failure and so you just say look you're heading for a launch failure you know what would you do yeah i mean like like one of the things there's 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 certainly a few things that uh that uh i i would emphasize more um i would want like through while i think a lot of the problems were the revenue model and uh and ratings bombings uh, another real problem was when people came on and they didn't feel like they they didn't have the achievements and the uh, and the uh, 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 the analog of whatever daily quests are just things uh, uh, things that made them feel compelled to play more. Uh, it was more of a paper game experience where you launch a game and the reason you play is because you enjoy playing and you find people to play. And a lot of the things which we plan to get in there in the long run should have been there right up front, like uh, uh, ways to really build your play. Like we intended for it to be more people playing against their friends uh, than b playing on a massive ladder. Uh, but, uh, but that wasn't made as solidly as it should have been on launch. And uh, and and the latter also has its place, right? Because uh, uh, at least you know uh, uh, some people feel like they're getting some value out of climbing a ladder, um, and uh, uh, and some people feel like they're getting value out of uh, uh, doing uh, achievements and so forth. And and paying attention to that, uh, you know, just having a bunch of things there for people to play right off the front up, up front, so they don't play it once and say, "Oh, there's too much RNG," and then stop playing. Yeah, I think that's probably the biggest thing is there. there's so much in the game that we think would have been taken care of if there were more social structures around it. And we really thought that those would sort of just occur. Um, and they didn't. And so it's like, what, what would we have done to uh, make the social structures spring up that we, you know, that we wanted? Like how easy it is to, you know, broadcast your tournament. Um, do you have a set organized play system so that like ahead of time so that people are immediately incentivized to, you know, start working toward that? Also, who who are your partners? Right? Like we didn't really have partners. It's it's a little strange to compare like the you know, the revenue model of this to say Magic the Gathering, because like in Magic, if you I don't know, spend ten bucks, you know four bucks of that goes back to wizards of the coast right because of the you know the re the retailer you know gets and the wholesaler gets some amount and so the thing is that it's um uh it, it's it, all that extra revenue is like going to the retail store which is not a waste right that's what's providing a place for people to play that's what's uh those are your partners that are like trying to encourage people to play because they're making money off it and none of that was really set up here so uh, just things like that of trying to go closer probably to the paper model um, where, but, but really not just like at the surface level, but like at a deep level where, you know, and especially if you think about the secondary market for magic, right? Like, you know, two thirds of the revenue or more goes to your helpers. So we, we just didn't have any kind of systems like that set up. Okay. So picking up that line of thought and uh, so we can wrap this up. With this overhaul that Valve is going to do now in the game, 
in you guys' opinion, what mechanics or features should really remain untouched? Because there's a lot of people saying that this should disappear, that should disappear, the RNG this, RNG that. I, I have, a, in my opinion, like every 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 aspect of the RNG is what makes artifact artifact. And a lot of people tend to go like, oh, the arrows should change like this, or that we should choose where we could put the creeps or whatever. Uh, in your guys' opinion, what are the exact features or mechanics that, in your opinion, should never be touched so artifact doesn't lose like its identity? Uh, well, uh, certainly a lot of the uh, RNG, which is in the bones, like the uh, place, the choosing where to put creeps or selecting the arrows, um, there has been a lot of experimentation with those during playtest. Inevitably, they always made the game worse. Uh, that's not to say that there isn't a solution, uh, you know, that 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 would make people happy, but it it is that that that. Uh, to say that uh, that whatever three years of experimentation failed to come up with something that uh, people weren't excited to try, then they said, "Wow, this was just worse than it was before." Um, so, uh, so I I, uh, I won't swear that there isn't uh, aren't changes along those lines, but I, I would bet that uh, that that if you start messing with uh, with the general structure uh, of uh, of random spawning of creeps and random arrow generation that you will make the game worse. Any projects that you want to talk about? Any upcoming things that um, you're excited to uh, to talk about if you're allowed? Uh, I, I think one thing that's taking up a lot of our time is Keyforge. Yeah, I don't know if you guys have played Keyforge. Awesome. It's it, it's awesome. A, a friend of mine at work has like two decks yeah. and he brings it to work. And, that's good. It wasn't interesting. We need to play a bit. A friend of mine owns a shop and I tried, so last time I went to Portugal where the shop is, um, I said, hey, you got a deck for me? And he said, um, I couldn't get my hands on any. So it was sold out apparently. Oh, all right. Well, that's uh, bad. They need to get more. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a super fun idea. It's actually an idea that Richard has had for an incredibly long time, uh, but just the mechanics of the printing process and making that cheap enough and everything like that weren't always amenable to it and so it's only relatively recently last five years or so that that it was you know a reasonable proposition uh and also like uh there's always new king of tokyo products coming out there's a new king of tokyo hopefully that'll be coming out you know in next year 2020 that's the, the plan at least uh if everything goes well and uh and we, we continue to work on small electronic things but n none of them are close enough to release that um that that we're pushing them so nothing that has a release date yet, we're gonna can we expect in like some years or some months uh another digital trading card game from you guys oh digital trading card game uh i would expect there will be another digital trading card game strongly uh it will not be in months i can promise you that <laughs> yeah but in the near in, in the long future yeah i mean i don't think it's that long you know, I would be surprised if one didn't come out before five years. But, uh, you know, it, the electronic games is there's nothing set in stone. And so who knows? With that, I, I mean, I could talk for hours, um, but uh, unfortunately, we have to stop at some point. Um, I wanted to thank both of you for, for coming up. I wanted to uh, I wanted to to, you know, emotionally uh, thank you, Richard, because uh, I mean, You've affected my life. You've changed my life with magic, and uh, and I love Artifact, and I hope that the game comes back. That's why we're still podcasting, we're still playing, um, and we're really hoping that uh, that Valve manages to turn everything around and that you guys can come back on work, work on those sweet expansions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Scaff, as well. Sure, no problem. Uh, it was a, a really uh, nice interview, and uh, who knows, maybe maybe we. we We'll be able to interview you in the future about uh, how we manage to turn things yeah. around. I hope yeah, that'd so. be great. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, it it is uh, it's also a real pleasure to talk to uh, some people uh, who who play the game and like it because uh, you know it's nice to reach some people and uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, no, that's uh, it's uh, good to talk about.
Once again, I would like to thank uh, Richard Garfield and Scott Elias for joining the cast. As always, I would like to say that if you liked this episode, you should uh, join our Discord. You can ask us questions, you can give us feedback, you can eventually join the cast for future episodes. Please follow and review us on all major podcast platforms, be it iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, TuneIn, Stitcher, or on YouTube. I would also like to make a final show note to thank all of you who are still part of this community, particularly those in our Discord server. It's just a game, but at the end of the day, you guys make it more than just that. Thank you.